Good morning, um, everybody, um, to this um, early morning press media briefing discussion. <laughs> we have a summit marathon behind us. Um, you could say it's still ongoing um, with US President um, Joe Biden still going to meet uh, Putin later on uh, today. But we thought that it would be a great opportunity um, to get uh, together um, and talk about the results um, of the summits um, and also to have some real experts um, and people who were very close and following intently um, what's been happening over the last um, four or five days. We heard that Joe Biden saying the United States is back. We heard that the NATO is back. We heard that the G7 is back and we heard that the US-EU transatlantic relationship is back. And I can say, and we are also back um, with our media briefings. <laughs> and so welcome everybody. Um, we have a stellar uh, group of speakers, media representatives with us today. Um, and let me just briefly um, introduce them to you. Um, so with us today is Cecile Boutelli. Um, she is economics and business correspondent um, of Le Monde. Hello, Cecile. Thank you for Hello. joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Um, Jan Dörner, um, he is security and foreign affairs correspondent from the Stuttgarter Zeitung, is with us today. Um, Jan, hello, and thanks for joining us. Good morning. Thank you. Then we have uh, Tanja Mastrobini. She is co correspondent uh, for Germany and Austria um, of La Repubblica. Hello. <laughs> thanks for joining us, Tanja. Um, Rob Schmitz from international, he's international correspondent, um, NPR. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Um, and for breakfast, I listen, I always listen to your colleague, colleagues of the politi political podcast. Um, Thank you. So thanks, uh, thanks for being here today. Um, and uh, Bartosz Wil Wilski, uh, deputy editor in chief of Gazeta Wyborska. And thank you so much, um, Bartosz, for being here today. Um, this is really, really wonderful. Good morning, thank you. <laughs> so for the first round, um, I'm going to ask all of our um, speakers a question for which I only want to have three words um, as an answer. Um, and my question is going to be, um, how would you describe in three words, adjectives or um, substantives, <laughs> the outcome of the um, three big summits of the last um, five days? And I would like to start with you, Cecile. Yeah, thank you. Um, my first word would be appeasement. I hesitated with joy <laughs> uh, or relief. Uh, my second word would be transition. And my third, third word would be new era. Oh, wow. That sounds like a very, I mean, a pretty positive um, summary. So Jan, your three words. So I would say turning point rivals and trade wow that is it's getting a little bit more complex here <laughs> um so tonia what are your three words my three words are convergency theater and aggressiveness Ooh, we are getting a little bit of a different point of view um, coming from two different sides. Um, this is promising for the discussion later on. Rob, um, your three words. So uh, I'm taking a page from the G7 Public Relations Department, who seems to be fond of three word phrases that I'll start with the letter B, building burned bridges. Oh, wow. Yeah, you're right. First word should be rebuilding, but... <laughs> We can be a little bit flexible with this. Um, and Bartosz, you have three words? Well, I have one word, ah. which is China. Oh, and that accounts for all three of them, I think. Yeah, I believe so, yeah. It's so very, very big. So this is interesting. Um, we have a whole mix of different views, and um, you already brought in different perspectives. Perspectives. Um, so let us dig a little bit deeper um, here. And so I would like to start uh, with Cecile. 
you are an um, economist and economic expert. You, you closely follow economic issues around the world. And the whole G7 summit was a lot about economic issues. Um, and we already heard, I mean, Rob just said three words and another three words is build back better, the three Bs. <laughs> um, Cecile, how would you judge um, the G7 summit with regard to its outcomes and the economic aspects? Yeah, what, uh, it's interesting. Uh, it's an interesting question because it raised also the question of the vocation of the summit in a in a world that where power is less and less reserved to the West for the West, um, and uh, in in a world in which in a West in which a United States would would be uh, still the uncontested leader. And uh, I think um, I think this uh, G7 community uh, uh, is full of this uh, of this new uh, of this relief, uh, which I was talking about uh, to uh, find themselves. The, the all uh, head of, of state are finding themselves again, like before the traumatic uh, Trump era, and uh, you could feel the almost the euphoria of of all the people, especially in. in Emmanuel Macron, and uh, it was very important to maintain this uh, this uh, good mood for the beginning of uh, yes of of uh, rebuilding uh, the alliance uh, after after Trump, but also after pandemic. So uh, uh, it's it's I would say uh, the the community is is uh, is uh, is full of this of this uh, of this willingness to to build back uh, uh, an alliance, uh, but also full of uh, of the um the common uh, challenge, uh, the, the the challenge uh, which are, are coming, and uh, that's uh, that's interesting because um, pandemic, so Trump era and pandemic has has uh, has um, uh, has uh, strengthened the, the the conviction in Europe uh, that Europe has to empower itself, and uh, it's an in military. And uh, commercially, and uh, and I must say, I was uh, very interesting uh, the last months uh, to observe the uh, the rapprochement uh, between Germany and France uh, in the in those both issues, and I've I've never observed such a uh, such a common effort to build something together in industrial resilience and in industrial policy, but also in fiscal policy. Policy. And that's what that was the big moment for me last year uh, with the closing of the of the of the borders. And uh, we can see in the in the communique of the G7 that uh, um, German and France and, and the whole Europe wants to play a different role in this new alliance. And uh, um, it's not uh, a, it's not. Um, yeah. Uh, Europe, it's, it was very clear that Europe doesn't want to be dragged uh, by Washington into a cold war with China, and which is, is very different in economically. Um, that's that the point, I, the first point I would, I would, I would uh, make. Thank you so much. Um, that's very interesting. Um, what would you say, uh, from your point of view in the declaration, what would you say struck you most, surprised you most, where you wouldn't have expected um, an agreement to be found? Well, um, I'm, I'm very happy to see that the return of dialogue is uh, uh, has, has come and it's very good news in terms of climate change that was expected but it's, uh, it's still important to underline um, the challenge is enormous and can be only be resolved uh, through cooperation it's also very important to, to talk about commune values again and uh, to be resigned uh, toward China uh, toward uh, to Russia I would say I would say um, I was was uh, surprised to see, uh, yeah, that uh, that the the words uh, um, about China, which is a big big elephant in the room, was softened, more softened than I would expected, with a more balanced view. And I think 
um, I think France uh, and of course Germany had played a big role to uh, soften the expectation or to 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 um, to reduce the expectation of Washington in uh, in a too much uh, too 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 hard uh, uh, position uh, toward China, uh, and that's uh, that's something I was. Uh, I, I was interesting to 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 read the the communique at this uh, very very point about this very point, and it would be of course a very interesting uh, issue in the future. Um, which is interesting is uh, the reaction of uh, um, Macron comment after the NATO summit uh, when he said that China had little to do with NATO. It it provoked a lot of reaction, and Macron did not understand mind the NATO communique. For him, it's important that the relationship with China is not only in confrontation, as just I, I was uh, in confrontation, but uh, not only mili but in dialogue. Uh, so he, he repeated several several times in the past that the, the challenges posed by China were, were not only military, but also economic and technological. And he believed that Europe is better positioned and equipped to respond to this challenge. And I think that's a point which would really be very interesting to follow in the past, because it's something which has to be discussed and it's a lot of nuance and that's a big role and the big mission for uh, for for Europe um, uh, who has a big interest to to have this uh, kind of multilater multilateralism I saw thank you so much Cecile I saw you nodding Rob um, when Cecile said that the language on China probably was um, oh, softened down a little <laughs> Rob, um, were you surprised? Uh, no, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> um, you know, and, and you know, if you, I, I can talk about my impressions about China if you'd like right now. Yes, please. You know, China was mentioned in the communiques that came out of these summits more than the country's ever been mentioned in in previous summits. And there, you know, there, of course, there are a few reasons for this. First, you know, the perceived global threat. Uh, of a rising China is one of uh, the few foreign policy postures that the Biden administration has inherited from the Trump administration without too many alterations. Uh, secondly, you know, for the past year or more, we all know that tensions between China and EU member states have been on the rise. And part of that, you know, is due to the familiar gripes about fair treatment for European businesses inside of China. But there are new sources of tension as well. You know, Beijing's mismanagement of the pandemic in its earliest days. Um, and its disinformation campaign uh, after the pandemic spread beyond its borders. Um, this worsening human rights situation in Xinjiang and Hong Kong is also contributing to this. And now we've got these tit for tat sanctions between the EU and uh, Beijing and a seemingly stalled EU-China investment uh, treaty. You know, Beijing's, with, uh, Beijing's uh, you know, relationship right now with the West is hitting new lows that we have not seen since the aftermath of the Tiananmen Square massacre more than 30 years ago. Uh, so amidst this, you know, Biden arrives uh, to Europe to try and rally uh, U.S. allies to form this united front against uh, what the U.S. sees as an increasingly aggressive and threatening Beijing. You know, Biden mentioned creating an alternative infrastructure building program uh, to, uh, to China's Belt and Road uh, Initiative uh, so that developing countries uh, can have an alternative, uh, you know, program to choose from, from a a uh, you know, democratic rule of law type of uh, system, you know, but all of this was sort of short on details. And it's hard to believe that, that Western construction contractors and banks will be able to outbid and outperform state-owned contractors and banks from Beijing who have just finished building inside of China the most extensive highway, subway, and high-speed rail systems the world has ever seen. Um, you know, so this so-called Build Back Better World uh, initiative seems like a great idea, but that's really all that it is at this stage. Meanwhile, China is economically and politically motivated to continue its Belt and Road program. Uh, and so are many of the countries that have taken on these projects. And, and it has a head start of several years. Um, I've, so I, I've been in Berlin for only two years. I'm a China specialist. I've lived on and off in China for 25 years. Uh, when I first moved there in 1996, uh, the best-selling book in China was titled China Can Say No. And it encouraged its readers 
to stand up to a growing US and Western influence inside of China at that time. And now 25 years later, the Biden administration, which is taking control of a deeply divided United States where its own system of government is, is under threat, you know, it arrives to Europe with this similar message that, that Europe can say no. Uh, you know, but this time the subject of this fear is, is you know, of course a rising and increasingly influential China. And it took 25 years uh, for the tables to, to completely turn uh, in this fear-induced uh, narrative. Um, in his speeches in Europe this past week, President Biden has repeated that the US is back. Uh, he says democracy has prevailed as the world's best form of government. You know, but lately, democracy in the United States seems to be at times sort of holding on by a thread. Uh, and members of the G7, as well as EU member states, are asking themselves after four years of a US president who pushed an America first foreign policy and who turned his back on Europe and withdrew his country from key international agreements and organizations like the Paris Climate Agreement and the World Health Organization, among other, among other actions that seem to go against traditional US principles and values, you know, Europe is asking itself, why should we say no to China? Uh, you know, this hesitancy can be read in the communiques that we've seen out of the G7, NATO, and the EU meetings this week. China's mentioned, yeah, but uh, many observers, and, and I think many observers have been magnifying the significance of all of that. Uh, but the language from the EU about China is, for the most part, pretty vague and soft, like you mentioned. Um, it's not specific, and it's questionable whether there will be meaningful follow-up actions regarding China on the EU's part. You know, Europeans have, have learned quite a bit about the United States in the last four years. And, you know, a simple change of administration is not going to erase those lessons. So, you know, this message that the Biden administration has, has brought with them to Europe, that Europe can say no, uh, you know, for some, this might apply just as much to the U.S. as it does uh, to China. That's really, really interesting. Thank you so much, uh, Rob. And there's a little bit of, I think, wait and see in your statement. Um, <laughs> there, there are lots of really nice announcements. Um, but let's see what's going to be implemented and what's going to happen. Jan, is this um, something you also saw um, during the NATO summit that there was a little bit of hesitancy um, towards accepting that the United States really is back? Well, I don't know. I think the main takeaway from the NATO summit is that America, or the, the summit, uh, all of the summit is that America is back. And um, I mean, that's Biden's message. Uh, he, which he delivered during his whole trip to Europe. And I think the other countries were, yeah, maybe a bit hesitant, but um, also relieved to hear uh, what Biden was saying. And I mean, that's especially the case for Germany because um, Trump criticized Germany constantly and in uh, particular for not spending enough money on detail and uh, on defense. And besides that, Merkel and Trump did not get along uh, at all on a personal level. And um, once uh, during the uh, Trump years, um, a German diplomat told me, um, we don't even know whom to talk to in Washington anymore. There aren't any reasonable people left. So um, I think that will change and that has changed already since uh, Biden took office. And um, but yeah, all that comes uh, at a price. Um, and that's maybe the second big takeaway from um, uh, the summits that um, we already talked about Biden's uh, or Biden trying to position um, the, the alliances towards uh, China. And um, for an export oriented economy like Germany, this is really difficult because the German economy and um, the Chinese economy are deeply intertwined. And um, some in Germany fear that the US will sooner or later ask what we in Germany call the Gretchenfrage, the mm -hmm. crucial question, which side are you on, ours or China's? And um, as Rob mentioned, I think that's a situation many in Germany, but also in Europe uh, would like to avoid. Yeah. and. Um, Maybe the last important thing from the NATO summit is that um, the alliance really want to prepare for future conflicts. You see that 
concerning uh, China, but also um, that they define climate change as a, a threat multiplier, but also that they defined uh, space um, as an area which uh, where attacks could lead to the invocation of Article 5. So, I mean, uh, besides China, um, we had a two or three very important other things um, emerging from these summits. Thank you so much, Jan, uh, for also pointing out that there are some sticky issues um, also on the transatlantic relationship, <laughs> our um, different, maybe slightly different views on China. And we might also have slightly different views um, on a partner and neighbor who is much closer, um, which brings me to Russia. And I wanted to ask you, Bartosz, um, uh, with regard to your take on the NATO summit, but also the EU-Russia and the US-Russia relationship. Um, what should we expect from the meeting today? And uh, what's your take on the issue? Well, uh, you can't change uh, geography, uh, even with the White House can't do that. And uh, all this talking about China, well, about the future, uh, new, well, possible and potential conflicts uh, in space or, well, caused by, by the climate change are, well, relevant and important. But you can change geography and can change that fact that uh, the Russia is main threat for, for the part of Europe I live. And, uh, and of course, uh, there's a shift of, of, of focus of US policy and uh, the NATO US allies uh, must, must adapt to that. Uh, but, uh, well, it was reassuring that at least Joe Biden's uh, stance on Russia is, is, is top. Is, uh, uh, and he was, well, responding uh, very, very well, sharply and uh, well, even aggressively on that uh, military buildup on Ukraine a few months ago. Well, there was a first kind of first test of, of, of uh, Kremlin. Uh, Kremlin wanted to test Biden, how, how, how he was reacting. And uh, I believe that uh, Joe Biden passed this, this, this test, uh, well, in a, in, a, in a good way. Uh, but the problem is, well, we can't forget, of course, about uh, the, the, the situation in, uh, uh, in, on the eastern flank. Uh, we observe uh, that uh, the war in Ukraine is still, still not frozen. There are still clashes. People are dying. Ukrainian soldiers are being you know, killed or abducted. We have a very unstable situation in Belarus, where Russia possibly is planning some kind of you know, incorporation or subvertive uh well uh, intervention or open military option uh well you, you, we can't predict what will happen with with belarus and we also observe a dramatic change in uh russian internal policy uh the putin's regime is getting more you know brutal towards the opposition it's trying to dwell any unrest uh, with uh well unbelievable force the story of of uh, alexei navalny is an example of this ruthlessness. And these are the challenges that NATO must be prepared that, well, we know that from the Cold War that uh, small incidents could evolve into serious major incidents and major uh, political problem. And from that perspective, for instance, the idea of, well, uh, building the Nord Stream 2 uh, gas pipeline is simply bad and uh, should have been rejected. Uh, because uh, in my view, uh, it's, that's how it's being perceived in Poland uh, this uh, pipeline uh, only well increases the dependency of Europeans from uh, Russian uh, energy uh, sources. Uh, I don't agree with uh, President Steinmeier who said uh, the no gas, this Nord Stream gas pipeline is a bridge to, between Russia and Europe. No, it's not a bridge. There's a connection that would be exploited by, by the Kremlin. And uh, as far as I, I was disgusted by Donald Trump policy, uh, I must say that his stance on this particular issue was, was, was correct. And uh, regrettably, uh, Joe Biden, well, decided to abandon any sanctions against the companies building a uh, Nord Stream pipeline uh, in order to, well, make the relations with, with uh, Chancellor Merkel better. Uh, well, from our perspective, this is a bad sign uh, that uh, our security interests are not being, you know, uh, there's, there's no, there is no good response for, from the US allies to our security interests. But it's the other side of the coin. Uh, please look what's happening in Poland, what's happening in many countries of the, of the so-called East of Frank. Uh, we are destroying our democracies. Uh, we have the populist governments who are just uh, dismantling democracy, dismantling the rule of law, uh, quelling free media, 
uh, putting a pressure to non-governmental organization. So if the Biden's uh, presidency will be about the values, uh, the alliance between Poland and the United States will be weaker because the Polish government is not respecting democratic values anymore. And I believe that if we would negotiate the, the uh, accession to NATO now, we wouldn't be allowed due to uh, all those serious breaches in uh, well democratic uh, uh, well rules. So, well, we are proof uh, that the NATO summit stressed the, the problem with Russia we have, and there will pro probably there will be new sanctions against uh, Russia, new sanctions against Belarus. This is uh, the, these are these are important steps. But if my country wants to be well had better by uh, U.S. administration, if they want to make have a serious input in European security policy, we must stop to uh, must stop demolition of of dismantling of our 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 democracy, which is uh, terribly important. And I also do uh, do regret that uh, it hasn't been stressed enough during this NATO summit that uh, some countries of Europe are simply behaving in a non-European way. That's my take. Thank you so much uh, for bringing in that uh, perspective as well. Um, and I'm sure that we come back um, to uh, the summit of four democracies um, later on in the discussion, um, where I think a lot of the issues are also also on the table. Now we um, a lot a lot of issues on the G7 agenda um, and in the communique cannot be implemented alone. Um, by the G7 countries, but they need allies for this. And this brings me also to the G G20 and um, uh, the upcoming summits. And um, the presidency of the G20 has Italy, uh, or is Italy. <laughs> so this brings me to Tonia. Um, what is, do you think that the G20 is actually going to accept what the G7 agreed? And will this actually turn into a global package? Yes, this is exactly the, the great question now. I mean, uh, Mario Draghi has, uh, is very familiar with G20 because he was uh, the first G20 that were created uh, during the financial crisis as the, uh, as the chief of the Financial Stability Board. He has a great familiarity also to some great leaders in the world like Joe Biden. Um, I think uh, his challenge will be, of course, to um, implement uh, some of the um, of the of the plans that Europeans and Americans have, have uh, are building together, for example, uh, the, the 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 corporation tax. I mean, this is a challenge, of course, or also climate change. But let me say a thing first, uh, and then I will I, I will I will complete my 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 reasoning. Um, I'm not very comfortable with the idea that uh, Europe hasn't changed towards China in these in these uh, times. I think. Um, the first, I mean, if, if we if we if we confront the the the, the uh, what the, the the NATO said 18 months ago, it, it hardly mentioned China. It said like China is opportunities and challenges. Okay, and now we have a communique, and I think it's the strongest that we had in these days. I think the the G7 was weaker than the NATO outcome in this sense because NATO said very clearly China is to us a systemic challenge. I think this is a big change. I think this is really a big, big change. And there are some premises to this, some important premises to this, also in the US and European uh, relationships. The first premise is Europe has been close and has, been, has converged as ever before. Uh, I think what happened in the last year, it's only, not only about Germany and France. This is very reductive to reduce everything in Europe always to Germany and France, because first we have had a pandemic and we have had a very, very, um, how do you say, ambition, ambitious European plan to come out of the pandemic with an economy recovery, or economic recovery. Uh, I'm speaking of, of course, of the next generation EU, but also all, all the instruments that have been put in place, like uh, the shore, uh, uh, the European investment banks and so on. So we have a miraculous moment in Europe of unity. The first consideration is this couldn't, I mean, we, we can't guarantee that this was, will, will last. We have elections coming in Germany and in France, very important elections. So um, what I want to say is Biden came in a, major, in a magic moment for Europe of unity, but we don't know if this will, will last. But this is a very important premise also for the G20, of course, because if we have a, a, a Europe where uh, Germany, Italy, France, and the, and the most important countries gather together and uh, converge 
on the main challenges and on the main objectives. This is very important. And I hear also very similar tones about China from these three countries. I mean, um, for example, um, uh, I mean, they, they were very cautious. Of, of course, first, Europe has made uh, has made very important changes in its policy towards China already, because uh, first, Italy said the Belt and Road Initiative will be revised, which is a very important uh, news that came out of these summits in these last, last days, because this was, uh, I think, uh, Europe was a little bit anxious about the role of Italy towards China in Europe. So this is changing now. Also, Germany is changing. Germany has started 2016 when it was shocked by the uh, shopping of KUKA, of one of its uh, high-tech um, jewels. No? So it's already changed laws. It's put in place 100 billion last year uh, that were called among my CDU friends uh, uh, sources uh, anti-Chinese funds. They have built a fund that has uh, the, the, the aim to protect German companies against Chinese shopping. So we have already many things in Europe changing. There has been an eye-opening event like the pandemic where China lied. And these the Europeans understood very, very good. So I think um, a lot has already changed in Europe towards China. This is the first thing that we have to... Uh, so what NATO is saying reflects something that is already happening in China. and not in a brutal way like in, in, in the United States with, with the Trump years, but some things have changed and have changed fundamentally in, in China. But uh, I think it's very important also that uh, Merkel and uh, Macron and Draghi and the other Euro European leaders tell Biden, we don't want to be the enemy of China. We, we have commercial relationship. We have to uh, involve China and I'm coming back to, to G20. We have to involve China in discussions about climate change. We have to involve China and the other countries in discussion about the corporate tax. So this is the challenge. I mean, Europe, um, and this is my last take. I mean, um, we have had a shocking experience with Trump, but I mean, it's not over. We don't know what would happen, no? Uh, we don't know if something like Trump is coming back. We don't know if we will have after Macron uh, Le Pen. We don't know what will happen in Germany, in Italy, of course. In Italy, in this moment, uh, the right-wing parties have the majority in the... In the so uh, so uh, this is a very magic moment, I think, for a European and transatlantic uh, convergency. But there are a lot of challenges and um, a lot has already been changing in this direction. So I think I'm optimistic, but I also say Draghi will have uh, a big task to uh, bring together again at one table uh, countries like China that have been attacked frontally now from uh, the most important uh, Western uh, organizations. And so uh, I think, but I think he's the one, he's the man of um, whatever it takes. So I think he could make it. He's a very, very smart diplomat and uh, politician. And I think, um, uh, what he has made also in these months already is 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 bringing back Italy Italy into Europe, and this this is also important. Thank you so much, um, uh, uh, Tonia, for your take, um, especially with regard to the G20. Um, I would now like to open it up um, for our participants, and just as a reminder, <laughs> I should have said that early in the beginning. Um, you can uh, raise your hand, your electronic hand, uh, going onto the little button of Teilnehmer, um, and then you see all the participants, and then you can raise your hand, or you can, and then I would call on you. Um, but you could also use the chat function. One thing we need to do first, though, is I would like to ask everybody to turn on their um, cameras. It's so much nicer to see everybody instead of talking to black screens. Um, and you also need to turn on your camera if you want to participate in a little exercise we are now going to do. Um, we will do a very simple polling. Um, and for this, you just need a little bit of a piece of paper. And when I ask you um, the first question, and you want to answer with yes, then you would put that in front of your camera. 
and then we won't see you anymore. Um, and if you think the answer is no, you will just stay um, on the screen and we will see all of you. So um, saying yes, covering your camera. So my first question to all of you is, um, were the summits, as we heard, a turning point um, in global governance? If you say yes, you would cover your... Ah, quite a few are saying, yes, it's a turning point. If you would say it's more of the same, nothing really changes, you would now cover up your camera. All right. Um, I think the more of the same is in the minority. Interesting. <laughs> this is something we are going to uh, pick up in our discussion. And I already have the first, um, uh, the first question um, in our chat function um, by Ned Wiley. Um, but Ned, um, I could, you could also ask your question directly if you want to. Um, we will unmute you and the floor could be yours, Ned. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear yes. you. A question has to, has to do with uh, <clears throat> the plans for enhancing uh, the European Union's military uh, posture and how that fits with NATO. Uh, and I guess also the remarks that Macron has made that uh, NATO is a North Atlantic alliance should deal with the North Atlantic and Asia is not part of the North Atlantic. So how does that all fit together uh, in terms of a, a coordinated policy on uh, a coordinated military strategy and a, and a, and a coordinated reaction to, uh, to Asia? Thank you so much, Ned. I would collect a few questions and then turn it back to um, our speakers. Um, and um, if you could be so kind and always uh, also say um, who you are, where you come from, that would also be, um, I think, interesting to our um, speakers. Um, so Ned, maybe you could also tell us um, where you come from. Well, I, I come from Chicago, but I've lived in Berlin now for 21 years. So, and, and I'm working uh, as an uh, international uh, market development advisor. Great, thank you so much. The next one on uh, my list is uh, which, Richard Dion. Um, Richard, the floor is yours. Stormy, thanks very much. Uh, my name is Richard Dion. I'm from the Connex Support Unit, um, which works on negotiation support uh, throughout the world, uh, helping governments. Uh, just a quick question. Africa came up on a few occasions the past week with regards to partnerships specifically. Given the critical mineral needs um, for the energy transition, does the need for these minerals in G7, in the G7 and also China, does that really trump a better deal for African governments in natural resources? Um, these, of course, these deals offer the best opportunity, or at least a promising opportunity for these African governments to grow. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Richard. And the third one um, on my list um, is Klaus Wittmann. Um, Klaus, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I'm Klaus Wittmann. I was senior fellow at the Aspen Institute here and I teach at Potsdam University. Uh, China has been very tough and intransigent. Does any of the speakers think that its leadership might have heard the message from the su summits and become more cooperative and subtle? Thank you so much, um, Klaus. And I also would like to mention, Klaus has just written an, an, an analysis for us um, on NATO, um, is spot on. So if you um, want some, some reading after our, um, after our morning discussion, um, you find that on our webpage. <laughs> and I take one more question. Um, and this is uh, Barbara um, Bechtholzheim. Um, and Barbara, um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the wonderful uh, summaries and um, opinions. Um, oh, I have to introduce myself. I teach at Free University Complete German American Literature, and I'm a translator and uh, author. Uh, my question is, um, there has been a lot of discussion recently, in particular before the summit, before Biden's visit, um, 
about the travel restrictions under COVID for the Schengen area. And I was wondering, uh, Biden in Brussels, uh, is it possible that this topic wasn't touched at all? Um, the lifting of the travel ban uh, in terms of reciprocity um, is hardly believable. Did, is there any news along those lines? Thank you so much, Barbara, for asking that question, because I wanted to do my vacation in the United States and I was hoping for a mutual recognition agreement, which I also didn't see and didn't find. <laughs> well, I've, I've just returned from the United States and I had to go there via Tanzania, so a little detour. I don't <laughs> want to do that again. So I, I um, turn back um, to our um, speakers and um, this time in a different order, um, I start with Rob. And Rob, you can decide who of our speakers will then go next. <laughs> oh, am I, <laughs> sorry, am I answering? I'm, I'm only going to answer probably with the China question, um, if that's okay. Oh, absolutely. Um, and I think that was Klaus's question, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that's a really good question, Klaus. And I think, I think um, whenever China receives international criticism, I think that the um, China's Communist Party internalizes that and picks it apart and really thinks about it. So I, I, yes, I do think that this type of, even though it's in some ways, I think very vague language on, on Europe's part, um, as Tanya mentioned, it's, 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 a, it's a significant policy change, right? And, and so I think this is something that the Chinese are, are paying attention to very closely and, and they will internalize it. They're not going to probably show that they are doing that. And I think that they will probably continue with the status quo, which is, um, you know, we first saw the reactions and I think I got it here because uh, I thought I might use this uh, uh, in, in response to the NATO uh, communique, uh, I think the, uh, the country's, uh, China's mission to the EU in Brussels posted something on Weibo, which is uh, one of the big uh, social media platforms in China. It's, and it called the, uh, it, it called the, uh, the communique a slander of China's peaceful development, a misjudgment of the international situation in its own role, and a continuation of the Cold War mentality. And so this is pretty typical, right? I mean, we've seen this over and over. Um, you know, this is often categorized as uh, wolf warrior diplomacy, uh, this sort of, this really kind of almost like tantrum-like response to uh, any sort of criticism of, of how China operates. And, and so I think on the, on externally, we're going to see more of that. That's not going to, that's not going to cease. But internally, I think that all of the, any criticism of China, this is something they really internalize. And then they have, they make a decision about, okay, are we going to really double down and fight back on this? Or is this something that will, that we will sort of handle, you know, subtly, like you mentioned, and, and it comes out in softer, quieter policies that are, are like gradual shifts. And I think it, it, this, in this case, it might. No. Oh, and I have to pick someone. Mm -hmm. uh, Cecile, why don't you go next? Yeah, thank you, Rob. Um, thank you for the interesting inputs. Uh, I would say this, uh, and, and I would I would say something before I, I, I specifically specifically uh, respond to a to a question. Uh, I pretty much agree uh, agree a lot with all what uh, Tonya talk uh, told uh, uh, so clearly. Uh, I agree a lot in the in the fact that uh, Europe uh, has been living the last twelve twelve months uh, a, a very strong moment, an unbelievable moment. And it started uh, uh, before. Uh, I, I, maybe in, maybe I, would, I would take two, two uh, day, two, two moments, uh, the, the, the Macron speech of the Sorbonne uh, in the fall uh, 20, uh, 2017, and he talked for the first time about the um, European sovereignty. And it was a big speech about whole Europe. And uh, it's obvious that his aims 
games. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the election next week will be tough. Uh, next year, 2022 uh, would be tough for him. But if he wins, he aims to, um, to put friends toward, uh, uh, to, to, to put friends toward in, a, in, a, in the European scene uh, in, in the absence of Angela Merkel, uh, to play a big role, bigger role in the transatlantic relationship with uh, with uh, uh, Mario Draghi, which is, uh, they, they have a, a very good relationship and uh, uh, they see in this relationship a good, uh, a good opportunity to uh, strengthen Europe in that way, in the way they, they wanted to to uh, the last, at, at least the last five years. And uh, I would say Germany has been very slow to react to this proposal and has been very skeptical toward Mario Draghi. But now we have two political um, who are almost on the same line and uh, and want to uh, strengthen uh, Europe militarily, e economically. And uh, no, it, I'm, I'm coming to, to the answer to the question of uh, um, Ned, I think. Thank you for your cash question. Uh, it's about sovereignty. And it's so interesting that even in Germany, the German industry, the BDE, uh, take this word of uh, sovereignty uh, in an economic sense. And uh, then uh, you have, of, co of course, the military uh, sovereign sovereignty, which is very complicated. Um, to organize because it's complicated with Germany and uh, it's uh, it comes with a lot of uh, of uh, of, of uh, investment. Uh, but I think, like uh, 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 Tonya, we are on a special moment. We are on a momentum, which many things are possible, and where the idea of sovereignty uh, in a multi multilateral world. Um, is uh, is taking uh, an importance that it never had before, I would say, or long, um, maybe in the last 30 years, 40 years, never. So uh, that's why I'm, I'm pretty much, uh, well, hopeful, I would say, not optimistic, but hopeful that something can happen. And uh, even if a lot of risks are remaining, of course. And uh, so I would strengthen that uh, Macron is, uh, is not talking about re NATO against Europe, uh, not at all. I think it uh, it's, uh, only wants to, uh, to make Europe stronger, uh, stronger, uh, stronger and um, and have uh, the the power to react and the power to yeah to have the capacity to react in a proper way. Thank you so much, Cecile. Because I'm afraid that we won't have time for another round of questions. Let me, before I turn it to our other speakers, um, briefly um, include the two two um, audience participants who um, still have a question. So, um, Chris, the floor is yours for your question. Thank you very much, Frau Sandleben, and wonderful good morning to you all. Uh, my name is Christian Mayer. I'm the Managing Director of MZ International, a uh, humanitarian and sustainability advisory group. Um, very simple question. Look, we face a lot more problems, as you all know, that we can only solve together. And I mean us not as Europeans, Cecile, but I mean us as humans on this planet. Uh, we had a lot of warm words about a green Marshall Plan, ambition to get the world vaccinated, debt relief, development and aid action. Great. But that is, to me, still a far cry from the solidarity package. That you can sort of listen in to Biden's language or the somewhat verbose French language. Um, and it's a far cry from providing the solidarity that I would have desperately hoped for uh, to produce a significant agreement at COP26 later this year in November, um, which I think we urgently need uh, for these cri connected crises um, where time, many of which where time is running out. And as I think as someone of you said, where small tipping points, uh, Bartos was you, can uh, create significant adverse outcomes. What is needed now? G7 is done, G20 is ahead of us now. What do we need to produce a more 
substantial solidarity package in whatever form in anticipation of this November meeting, COP26. Well, thank you so much, Chris. And I'm a little envious of you sitting outside um, in the sun under. <laughs> oh, it's fantastic. I love it. A home office is underrated. <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, let me just briefly read what uh, Leo Penta um, has been asking. He's um, asking if there are any indications when major European ambassadorial posts will be filled um, by Biden. Um, but before we um, answer that question, um, and I will ask that in the end, uh, Rob, um, you can think of an answer to this already. But let me first um, turn to Tunja. Not look happy. Um, <laughs> let me first uh, turn um, back the floor to Tonia. Yeah, I think there was a, a question about Africa, which I think is very important because um, Africa will be one of the challenges if. Uh, if it's a continent where China has exercised its soft power for years and um, uh, Europe has totally uh, uh, turned its, its back to this uh, fact. And uh, as I said before, I mean, uh, the pandemic has contributed to uh, an eyes opening uh, uh, stance in Europe um, towards uh, China uh, and the fact that uh, also this soft power has to be in a certain sense um, um, fault. I mean, in, in the last years, we have seen uh, Macron and, and Merkel uh, also very active in, in, in trying to uh, help some African countries to de de develop better. Of course, it was also a cynical aim because uh, from many of these countries, uh, the, the migrants come. And so it was a sort of, uh, but there is, there is an attention, more attention than I think 10 years ago uh, to Africa. Also, in the sense of um, how we ca can we can we contrast the the, the soft power of China there? Um, what, what I think I think we we didn't speak too much about Russia today. I wanted only to see a thing. I think um, what we have to think about uh, Russia, which I mean, the focus has shifted to China, but Russia is still a very very important. Uh, and Bart, I think, reminded us what is happening since uh, 2014. There is a sort of war of uh, low intensity at the doors of Europe. And um, I think we will miss a lot Angela Merkel because Angela Merkel was one of the few leaders in the world, in the Western world, who could really read uh, Putin's head. She was unimpressed by his uh, machist uh, attitudes. She was unimpressed by his dog. But um, what she did and what was very important, I think, for example, 2008 at the Bucharest meeting of NATO, uh, she said, we can't let Ukraine and Georgia into the NATO. We have to think about this because we are going in the foregarden of Russia. This is uh, felt by uh, Putin like a provocation. And as this topic is coming again, as Biden is talking again about extending uh, the NATO alliance to, to Ukraine, we have to consider always, we have to go into Putin's head and consider what, is, what, is this, what does this mean for Russia? So I think this is also something that we should never forget. The Europeans need more than the Americans to have a dialogue with Russia. Of course, it's a dialogue with some red lines and Merkel has showed them very, very, in a very hard way. Now she has shown with Navalny that she can draw these lines. But I think we will miss her because I don't see any leader in Europe that has the same capability um, to, uh, understand how to cope with such a different leader, uh, such a, in a certain sense, also dangerous leader that in the, and, and I'm finishing my, my, my in, 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 in these years, we must never forget how Russia has penetrated into the Mediterranean, into the Middle East, because of the void that was left by the Americans. I mean, Russia is very powerful now, and we can't forget this, and we can't stop a dialogue with this country. Thank you so much, uh, Tonia. Um, Bartosz, I'm really, I'm really glad that we have those electronic yeah. signs um, to, <laughs> to express ex, uh, expressions. Um, because first I looked at your face and I thought you were disagreeing with Tonia, but it seems you are actually agreeing with Tonia. <laughs> Well, I'm agreeing to some point. Uh, well, those hands are, well, I got used to that way of communicating during the homework for, for last year. But uh, of course, Russia is powerful, but we must, uh, well, uh, 
be uh, aware what's the reason of the power. The reason of the power is the army, uh, is the, well, secret service, uh, intelligence, and uh, police apparatus. It's not a strength, you know, of the uh, society. It's not a strength, you know, of uh, open and uh, innovative economy. This is not the strength of science and research. This is a part, this is a country which, well, still is rule and uh, the leaders are, they, they, they still perceive that the word in, you know, uh, 20th century terms, uh, the power as a military projection. And when you have such a player, you can't, you know, normally make a dialogue with him, uh, talk on, on different issues and try to solve uh, debates, you know, while discussing uh, politely and gently. <clears throat> The Russia understands the, the language of power, unfortunately. So you have to, to show that you are strong, that you won't hesitate to defend your grant, that your allies uh, will be protected. And all, the, all those mishaps of European Western uh, policy uh, towards Russia was that they were reluctant to show their power. They were reluctant to, to, to speak with Russia in terms of, 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 of power. Uh, they were not opposing Russia. And probably if we uh, will, wouldn't try this, this shameful reset, which uh, Obama uh, uh, tried to impose in 2009, uh, the things wouldn't go that far as, as they went in, in 2014. Uh, Nord Stream uh, 2 is also a sign of, you know, of uh, lack of willingness to, 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 to uh, face uh, this, this Russian challenge by, by, by Europeans, by, by the Germans, and all of subvertive operation, which Sanya mentioned in Italy, in, in Germany, in Austria, uh, in, in Western Union are also, also fighting. But uh, that's what, uh, that what I would expect from Biden's administration is to start uh, talking uh, with Russia as we talk with, with, with mafia, with, with tax there. They're just that. Look what they are doing with the old people. Look what they did with uh, Alexei Navalny. They have poisoned him with with a with a with a well uh, toxic substance which is illegal, which is banned, you know, uh, to the chemical warfare convention. So so we, we we have to stop trusting them, trusting them they could be our partners. No, they are opponents. That's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Bartosz. And I see in the chat function um, that. Uh, quite a few um, of our participants are agreeing with you. <laughs> um, and um, let me last turn to Jan. Um, there are still a few questions unanswered, <laughs> but um, I would like to ask you to pick and choose. So, um, I mean, if I can choose, I would uh, add something about um, the elections in Germany in the fall. So, I mean, this is a very important uh, point because I mean Merkel will be leaving very big shoes to fill and, and that's not only on the European or international level uh, concerning maybe uh, a, uh, someone in Europe who can talk to Putin both in Russian and in German because Putin uh, is fluent in German as uh, Merkel is fluent in Russian but I mean um, from the today's point of view, we are pretty sure that the Greens will be participating in the next German government. And then we could see some interesting changes in uh, German positions that, for example, um, concerns uh, the 2% goal uh, in NATO, because the Greens are opposing that. And on the other hand, they are opposing um, or they are in favor of shutting down Nord Stream 2 immediately. So um, I think, um, so we are having a, a debate now about um, what's, where we're standing about this uh, series of summits, but maybe we can discuss all that later when uh, maybe at the beginning of next year when we know who's heading the next German government, because some of the topics we discussed today then will appear in maybe in a new light. And I would love to have all of you back again um, when we have this discussion. Before we have to come to a close, uh, Rob, who's going to be the next US ambassador to Germany? <laughs> oh my idea? gosh. <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, I, let's, let's hope that it's not a, I think a lot of people are hoping that it's not a political donor to the Biden campaign because um, the, the habit of US presidents to do that uh, I think hurts the entire process. And it looks like, you know, yesterday there were 
a new batch of nominees for ambassadors. Uh, I think there were eight of them, if I'm not mistaken, and half of them were former foreign service officers. So I, that's that's a that's a positive sign, uh, and hopefully that continues once we see the nominees for for the European post. And if I'm not mistaken, I think it was Julie Smith who is nominated for NATO. That's um, right. And yeah. that is, I think that is an excellent choice. That's that's um, an excellent, exciting choice. Yeah. A wonderful, definitely a wonderful woman. For the very closing round, I want to come back to my very first question when I asked you about the three words uh, for the summits. Um, and I would like to ask again, all of you to add one more word um, after the discussion we had. Um, and with this word, you can we, either we confirm your three words or you could readjust um, your three words. Um, and let me um, do it in the same order as last time. Um, or no, let's, let's mix it up. Let's start with Rob and then Cecile, Tonia, Jan and Bartosz. Uh, putting me on the spot, uh, hope. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Which is, it's always a good word. It's always a good yeah, word. It's, um, it's an easy one. I'm sorry, I wanted to say, uh, to say the same words. So <laughs> what can I do? <laughs> no, Tonya. I That's wanted to say the same. I'm sorry. <laughs> to see you. Well, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's not 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 to share that uh, very because it's very positive. I would say balance, maybe. Perfect. Thank you so much, um, Jan. And yeah, maybe um, inspired by the question Chris was asking about the COP uh, conference. Um, and we didn't talk so much about climate this morning. So I would say um, climate crisis. Thank you so much. And Bartosz? Well, I'll stick to China. Uh, <laughs> Four times China. And well, that sums, thank you so much. And that sums it up for today. Um, this has been, for me, an enlightening discussion. I took away a lot. Um, thank you so much for being here this moment, uh, this morning. Um, I know that you do have a lot on your plate, um, so we appreciate it particularly that you took the time. We hope to see you again. We hope to see our participants again, and we will continue with these media breakfasts, hopefully later on this year or early next year, with a real cup of coffee and not a virtual one and a real croissant. We would love to see you again. We wish you a good, good week. Um, keep us posted with your articles and your, um, your news reporting. Um, we depend, we rely on your um, expertise and analysis and judgment. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Thank you. Take care.